please type all of your questions on the Q&A chat box in the end of the presentation. We are going to have a good discussion and we are going to be happy to answer all of your questions and you can type your opinion as well, your experiences. Please uh, be with us and we want everybody to participate. Uh, just to, to remind you to follow us on social media and to subscribe, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, this uh, journal club is being uh, broadcast live on YouTube and the recording is going to be there on YouTube so you can watch again and share with your team members. Uh, just a quick reminder, save the date. Uh, in 2023, the place to be is going to be Washington, D.C. The World Congress of Pediatric Cardiology and Cardiac Surgery is going to be something amazing. The preparations awesome. are, are, are... It's going to be awesome. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's it, Gil. So please be with us. Uh, it's going to be save the date, August, uh, end of August, beginning of September 2023. We are going to meet you all in person, finally, in Washington, D.C. So we have uh, some activities happening in Congenital Heart Academy in the next couple of weeks. So we have on the 31st, our fetal cardiology meeting is going to be a very nice, uh, very good speakers. If you're interested in fetal cardiology, please uh, join us. We have on the 5th of April, Dr. Uh, Silverman continue his um, morphological cardiography uh, a series. He's going to talk about hypoplasia of the right heart. It's going to be awesome. Dr. Anderson is doing a very nice series uh, with Diane Spicer, Adrian and Justin. They are making correlations with uh, anatomy, embryology, and the 3D uh, dissection from CT scan that Justin is, is showing us. It's, it's been a very nice series. If you haven't seen it, check on the YouTube channel. And on the 22nd of April, we are going to talk about systemic uh, venous anomalies. And uh, our dear Dr. Mary Cohen is with us as well. On the 22nd of April, a little bit later, we are going to talk about the images of the anomalous pulmonary veins. So now with you, we are going to start our journal club, who is going to present the paper uh, before the panelists uh, start to discuss. It's uh, Dr. Paulo Nino. He is from Venezuela, and uh, he did his uh, pediatrics residency in University of Miami, and uh, he's going to uh, uh, go now to Cincinnati to do palliative care, pediatric palliative care, and he's going to present uh, this paper uh, to us. Thank you all very much for being with us today. I'm sure this is going to be great. Thank you, Grace, for the warm introduction and for the kind invitation. Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to show my screen right now. All righty, uh, I'm really happy to have the opportunity to present this paper. This actually combines my two biggest passions in medicine, which are critical care, pediatric critical care, and palliative care. Uh, and the topic that we're going to be discussing is compassionate ECMO discontinuation. I have no uh, financial disclosures uh, to reveal. Uh, we know ECMO is associated with high uh, mortality, and uh, we all understand that there are very specific physiological, pharmacological, and technical considerations that make ECMO a very unique type of therapy in medicine, probably uh, difficult to compare to any other. Uh, regardless of the high mortality and these specific uh, features, we do have very limited guidance regarding end of life uh, when the patient is on ECMO. This creates a perfect substrate for this topic. Uh, and the key message that they are, uh, the authors want to deliver with this article and that we want actually to expand with the discussion today is one, the review of the unique aspects of end of life when the patients are on ECMO. And then to propose a pragmatic interdisciplinary framework for compassionate ECMO discontinuation in both children and adults. Now, as I mentioned before, I'm quite passionate about this topic that combines my two biggest interests. Uh, and of course, uh, the main author, Dr. Machado, is quite passionate about this topic as well. I cannot miss the chance just to ask her, since we're, we have the luxury of having her among us. Uh, Dr. Machado, can you tell us a little bit about the motivation, about the driving force that led you to write about this topic, please? Thank you, Paulo. Succinct and great uh, introduction. Like you said, I think there was very limited literature 
And if you compare the um, usage of ventricular assist devices and ECMO, ECMO is way more common, especially with facing pandemia, like uh, we face COVID since 2020. ECMO delivery in even uh, smaller capacity centers became way more frequent. And we know the numbers from ELSO and the survival in general for if a patient experienced ECMO uh, close to 50%. If you have some uh, risk of dying or close to 40%, it is very important to have a strategical pragmatic approach for end of life uh, um, strategies and neck mode discontinuation. Absolutely. One more Thank thing you. is um, when I wrote the uh, compassionate uh, VAD discontinuation in Journal of Heart Lung Transplantation 2018, it, 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 was, it was felt that there was this unmet need. If, um, if a, a, a one of the things that we thought was also important is uh, to change the lack of attention, uh, to change the attention from cardiac support to also comprehend respiratory support and different strategies of cannulation, like central cannulation, peripheral cannulation, in, or multiple site cannulation. How can you approach and standardize methods and generate quality at end of life experience? I'm going to stay with the last sentence you said with the end of the quality around the end of life experience. Um, we do know that our patients that are on ECMO have varying degrees of multi-organ failure. In the best case scenario, they only have one or two of the most important organs, lungs or heart. But in many cases, uh, it's multiple, uh, multiple organ involvement. Uh, because of this, very often they require additional technological support that creates and unpredictable requirement of sedation, analgesia, and pretty much changes the whole way that we manage the patient. We must keep in mind that even when do the, we do this more or less frequently, uh, probably for some of us on a daily basis, for these families, this is a once in a lifetime event. Uh, and we as providers have the opportunity uh, to make this turning point in their lives less difficult to deal with. It is difficult, uh, if not impossible, to provide a good death if we don't really know what exactly is the definition of a good death. Uh, we know not only for ECMO, but end of life in general, most time uh, some specifics, for example, it must be in, con in concordance with the goals of the patient and the family, must ensure comfort and dignity, must maintain safety, and of course, enhance the well-being of providers as well. Uh, we have uh, the beautiful opportunity to share with people and participants from all over the world today uh, with very different backgrounds, cultural backgrounds, uh, maybe spiritual beliefs as well. Uh, and being so, our concept and definition of a good death might be different. Just like for our patients, it might be different as well from one to the other. Um, in an attempt to come up with a universal definition uh, for what a good death is, the National Academy of Medicine defines this as one that is free from avoidable distress and suffering for patients, families, and caregivers. It must be in general accord with the parents and family's wishes. And it must be reasonably consistent with clinical, cultural, and et ethical standards. I'd like to uh, make all the participants think about considering your specific background what do you guys think a good death mean for you? Now, don't worry, I won't put you in the spotlight and I want to make you answer out loud in front of everybody. Uh, we have some experts to do that for us. So I would actually would like to uh, invite Dr. Moynihan and Dr. Moskutsa uh, to maybe share what they uh, have for a definition of what a good death is. Is there such a thing as a good death? And what a good death exactly mean to you guys? I, I can uh, I can take the the first shot at this. Um, real, thanks heaps for the uh, invite and Paolo's fantastic presentation so far. So 
I mean, a good death is a very nebulous term. And I think um, acknowledging, we have to acknowledge that um, the death of a child in particular, I mean, I work in a pediatric setting, um, but even um, in an adult setting, death is, is always going to be a tragedy. And so we have to um, kind of strive to provide high quality end of life care to make this experience as good as it can be for um, the patient and also their loved ones. Um, I can provide a little bit of kind of background data from a paper that we recently published in the pediatric cardiac intensive care setting. Uh, interviewing bereaved families in terms of what sorts of things are associated with um, a good death experience versus a, a negative death experience. And we looked at both medical factors and also uh, parents' perceptions around their end-of-life experiences um, and found some, some interesting findings about what things um, were perceived to be associated with a, with a, what we called a good death experience. And obviously, the numbers are, are quite um, small, so it was a brief uh, survey, a brief family survey of 44 families of um, who'd lost a child with, with heart disease. And overall, um, approximately 70% of families agreed somewhat or strongly that their child had experienced a good death um, in the cardiac intensive care setting. And just to kind of briefly summarise some of the, the key factors that were associated with a um, uh, positive experience at end of life was when the child was free of pain, uh, when the families were not surprised at the timing um, of death, when they were prepared uh, for the death experience, when they'd had prior discussions with their health provision team about um, end of life care and, and what that would look like, uh, when they had um, when they'd reframed their goals of care towards a palliative type approach, and interestingly, the only medical uh, intervention that was associated with um, a bad death or a negative um, perception of, of the death experience was CPR at end of life. So cardiopulmonary resuscitation or chest compressions at end of life was associated with disagreement um, with a good death. Okay, and Dr. Franco uh, needs to excuse himself. He is our uh, chair of the ethical committee of Cedar Medicine and uh, amazing anesthesiologist and his case uh, is being late. So he's still on the OR. He's so sorry. He could not join this beginning. Thank you very I'm much. I'm gonna add what Katie uh, wrote in her paper and I'm sure I'm not gonna quote this right but it was a quote from a parent that said that the death of a child resembles the birth of a child, right? It only happens once. So uh, to, to Katie's point, uh, it's it very important to have that um, ability to provide good and standardized, but also individualized care uh, to patients and families at that experience. Yeah, Desi, I, I completely agree. I mean, our, the holy grail really that we're all aiming for here is um, in providing high quality end of life care is to provide goal concordant care. And we need to elicit what that means for every individual family. And as Paolo quite beautifully articulated, that is different for every single family. And so it's really important to elicit that through our high quality communication techniques um, and develop those therapeutic relationships so we can um, kind of create and build those values around, um, around end of life care with families. Absolutely. And actually, it, it is easier said than done, right? Sometimes this can be a little bit challenging, um, but it's precisely this pursuit for providing a good death to our patients what led the authors to write about compassionate ECMO discontinuation. Compassionate ECMO discontinuation entails the cessation of ECMO support in the setting of death being the expected outcome. And this is, of course, different from the cannulation when what we actually expect is survival. And this shift in the expectation may be secondary to a couple of factors. One of them could be just the disease progression. We were mentioning how COVID, uh, we have had patients that uh, sadly, you know, the lungs did not recover and will never recover. Uh, and being so ECMO uh, needs to be discontinued. Maybe secondary to complications, maybe uh, new bleeding events, uh, which is a common complication. Uh, or maybe keeping in mind that ECMO is not an end goal therapy, but a bridge to something else. Uh, maybe that end therapy is not an, an option anymore. Uh, and we're talking about maybe a transplant or the implantation of a mechanical device. If the patient is not a candidate for that end therapy, then ECMO by itself as a bridge therapy doesn't play a role anymore. 
uh, the approach that is proposed by the authors uh, is based on the literature review and the palliative care uh, principles. Uh, they actually adapted a checklist uh, from ventricular assist devices, the activation, uh, to the unique scenario that ECMO represents. Even when VAD and ECMO are somehow similar uh, therapies, there are very, very specific uh, differences that we're going to uh, discuss in a little bit. Uh, some of these differences, for example, patients on VAD usually have a period of stability that allows for some discussion, some communication that on ECMO not always uh, is possible. Uh, they might actually survive beyond ICU stay. Uh, they may have only a single organ failure. And again, the deactivation uh, factors may be very similar to, to ECMO, actually. Uh, we will have to differentiate if our patient is on VA ECMO, VV ECMO. Uh, of course, this starts with the etiology of their disease and what type of support are we providing through ECMO, correct? Uh, this may add extra uh, complexity to the scenario we're discussing. Um, pretty much the goal would be to allow natural death. And I thought this was a fascinating concept because we're talking about uh, one of the highest, if, if not the highest level of support that we have in medicine, uh, but still we have room to mention uh, natural death. So I'd like to uh, call in Dr. Machado and uh, discuss a little bit how is it possible to allow a natural death when we're in one of the highest uh, uh, level uh, of therapy in medicine. Thank you, Paulo. I think one of the most important things when talking to the families and approaching families in discussion end of life in patient supportive and mechanical circulatory support is to keep the focus of the disease process of the baseline disease that led indication of mechanical circulatory support. And I think that helps families and healthcare providers to accept the fact that the, the natural history of the disease or the progression of disease is what's leading the patient to die. Of course, we know that patients can die off complications of mechanical circulatory support, but they wouldn't have been on mechanical circulatory support if they weren't sick and required that support for the first disease uh, baseline. So keeping the focus of the attention when you approach end of life discussion on mechanical circulatory support is, what is the disease that led mechanical circulatory support indication? I think that's the holy grail of any kind of compassionate mechanical circulatory support discontinuation. So it takes away the, um, the, the subjective feeling that we are discontinuing something that is saving the patient's life. No, you're supporting the patient's life, right? Without that, without mechanical circulatory support, the patient would have died from the primary disease process firsthand. And I think that's very important and it's very applicable to other methods of uh, life-sustaining therapies like tracheostomy, ventilation, dialysis. Without those methods, the patients would have died from the primary disease. And that's the concept of allowing natural death. Um, and uh, I think there is also a sense that from the healthcare provider's standpoint, most importantly, that oh, we invested so much in this patient putting this um, complex machines to them. And at the end, we're stopping that. No, it, I think the shift needs to be addressed to the baseline disease, like I said, and less of like how much we invested. We did our job, right? We did our diligent job, but unfortunately, sometimes we cannot prevent that. Absolutely. I'll, just briefly, I'll just briefly echo what, what Desi says and just add the additional benefit of unburdening of decision making in that context. And, and by framing it this way, I think it, um, it certainly is a step towards alleviating a, a lot of the burdens of decision making and, and kind of future decisional regret that, that families may feel if we frame the end of life experience around the fact that um, this is a death, that, a natural death that relates to the underlying disease process and, and not as a result of a decision that has been made. 
And I think a key factor, and we're going to touch base uh, on this later on, is communication, right? Open communication with the families. Um, compassionate ECMO discontinuation uh, is, is uh, we have a couple of steps um, that we need to achieve that, right? One of them, the first one is, is again, communication, having family end of life discussions, uh, some clinical aspects, some technical or logistical aspects, and then bereavement. And this is a nice graphic representation of, of the process with the four steps uh, on the right. We're going to start touching base with the first step, uh, family end of life discussions high quality communication. And I'm going to allow myself to spend some time uh, with this because if, if one thing I've learned in my brief career so far is how important timing is. Uh, to the point that it reminds me, for example, when we're dealing with sepsis, when we are uh, coding a patient, uh, there are some uh, factors and some markers for uh, outcomes, right? Being, for example, the first dose of antibiotics, first dose of epinephrine, uh, this applies also to the timing of communication conversations about end of life with the families. Now, can we give epinephrine 25 minutes into CPR? Well, of course we can, but what outcome are we going to get out of it? Uh, in the same way, uh, can we have these conversations later on when we are already in the process of uh, end of life? Of course we can, but the outcome again, just like in sepsis and uh, coding a patient, is probably going to be suboptimal. Communication, when it's open, when it's early, when it's sincere, it actually allows us to uh, develop prognosis awareness within the family and the patient, elicits values, builds trust, uh, and at the end of the day is going to facilitate not only the decision making at the uh, end of life itself, um, but also is going to alleviate uh, the stress and anxiety that patients and families have. I think, uh, and I tell this to, to my patients and their parents, their families, I think the biggest um, uh, trigger for anxiety is the uncertainty, the lack of information, because we may deliver good or bad news, but if the families understand what's going on, I think that actually helps calm down the anxiety levels. Um, we must actually explore what is important for the patient and the family, like we were mentioning before, and this includes spiritual and religious needs. We must inquire about the degree of physical connection. Has this baby been intubated for weeks on ECMO for another couple of weeks? When was the last time this baby was held uh, by their parents? Uh, and we may actually offer some period of time that allows the parents uh, to celebrate the life of not only the parents, all family members. I mean, in pediatrics, that are, my default is the parents, but family members, right? To celebrate the life of their uh, loved one. Uh, and of course, uh, we have some techniques like mementos and legacy uh, building. Um, I think the key point here is, and I loved when uh, a couple of panelists actually mentioned it before, it's about individualizing the experience. It's like if you have uh, your kids, you do not give the same birthday gift to all of them throughout the year, right? Because some of them like soccer, some of them like music, some of them like uh, video games. So you cannot give the, the same gift to all your kids. In the same way, as we are trying to uh, standardize care in end of life, uh, we must take in consideration the individualization and the diversity that our population of patients represent. Timing, timing, timing is always a key factor. Uh, we must uh, explain as well um, some of the changes that uh, parents or, or actually many of us may not anticipate. Uh, and it's the changes that uh, take place after death, right? There are changes in color, changes in temperature, uh, maybe swelling, maybe bleeding. Uh, and it's a role to actually prepare the family for these changes. So they are not surprised by it. A key factor is always to reassure the family that symptoms control is a priority for us as healthcare providers. It is as important to us as it is for them. And when the families understand that we uh, are on the same page in that regard, again, I think the anxiety levels uh, and the distress uh, can come down. We must document all the discussions, the participants, what was discussed, the goals that were achieved. Uh, maybe discuss and document potential circuit failure and what to do in that case. And in general, some specifics like organ donation, funeral arrangements, and autopsy probably should be discussed later on in a uh, subsequent 
type of meeting. Uh, if you check the article itself, you will find that uh, the authors provided us with some checklists that I find are quite useful. We're not going to discuss them in detail, but I just want to bring to your awareness uh, that it's actually available, and I think it's, it's fantastic. After discussing the communication and the family meeting, let's go to step two with the clinical aspects. Symptom management is going to uh, vary depending on the type of cannulation that we have, VA versus VB, ECMO, and we discuss about what exactly is ECMO providing, what exactly we won't be providing after this continuation, and then what symptoms can we develop. Our patients usually have uh, tachyphylaxis, <clears throat> polypharmacy. It, it makes it very challenging to, to manage in general. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Uh, and there are many considerations that the intensivist in me really, really uh, gets passionate about. I know it's not the focus of the conversation, but Dr. Machado, please, uh, would you mind giving a little bit of a summary because I think it's quite interesting uh, about the pharmacological considerations when we're uh, thinking about uh, discontinuing ECMO in a patient? Thank you, Paul. Um, in my, sometimes I feel the way I write the things and the article, but I think specific to mechanical circulatory support, I think if the patient after uh, uh, mechanical circulatory, circulatory support discontinuation, if the patient has significant uh, signs of discomfort, you're already behind the ball. Uh, so I think the, the key factor is prevention in that sense. The moment that uh, mechanical circulatory support is interrupted or is approaching the end of life, there are significant physiological differences that are pre-support, right? The pre-support discontinuation, uh, either on pharmacodynamics, um, pharmacokinetics, um, if it put in context that the patient that is dying already is on multi-organ dysfunction, the rate of elimination of drugs is completely changed. If you are further discontinuing dialysis or any other uh, support therapies, you have to take this in, into consideration. Even more important to have a multidisciplinary team like a, pharmaco a pharmacist at hand in preparation for these scenarios. Well, the classical example, we don't have to even talk about um, mechanical support discontinuation. Like if you just change an ECMO circuit, for example, the patient might be well sedated, comfortable uh, with appropriate steady states of medication. And all of a sudden you put a uh, new circuit that has not been coated with medications and you have a sudden drop on the steady state levels of all your medications, including sedatives and opioids. So this needs to be very well uh, taught beforehand, before stopping any support. And on top of that, if you talk, uh, if, if you think specifically about cardiac support and VA ECMO, uh, the, as the cardiac output or the delivery of systemic output is suddenly decreased, if you give a medication or any medication, time to pick effect is gonna be suddenly decreased because your cardiac output is decreased, right? Or the artificial cardiac output supplied by the machine is uh, suddenly decreased or stopped. So if you give any medication in that sense, after if the patient has any cardiac residual, uh, residual cardiac output, time to peak effect is going to be severely delayed. And that's why we stress the importance of paying assurance of comfort levels before this, immediately before this continuating support. Um. Apollo, if, if you may uh, allow me uh, for a second, uh, thank you for the opportunity, Daniel, uh, here. Um, I think uh, uh, what Desiree said is so important because uh, the act of discontinuation, the physical act of discontinuation, it can be very stressful for the families, but also for the healthcare professionals. Mm -hmm. So if you allow a patient on top of the act of cutting the line, so to speak, uh, to be uncomfortable and in distress, you are now hitting 
the healthcare professional twice. One, by the difficult timing of having to do that act. And then second is seeing the patient suffer. So it's so important that you provide already prior to discontinuation, good amount of sedatives in agreement with the family and not to enhance uh, and speed up death, but to guarantee with your ethical principle of not causing harm uh, and the principle of proportionality that you're giving what the proportion of your action is and uh, your intention, which is not enhance death, but is to actually give comfort. This is fundamental. So you're protecting both the family and your colleagues and yourself. And the other point I wanna make is from the prior point that you made about communication. I think we have to realize that a good ending is starts with a good beginning. So if you start ECMO uh, badly, uh, not having a good communication with the family about the purpose of ECMO. And the family will understand that ECMO is going to save their kid's life because ECMO is a treatment. Then when you're going to stop it, they'll understand that your treatment has failed. But when you go and tell them that this is a bridge to something, either a cure because of the disease process is going to get better with your antibiotics, for example, or your heart is going to recover from the surgery, from being stunned from the bypass, then the family will understand better if that doesn't happen because you never promised that the ECMO is going to be the miracle cure. So it's very important that the family understands right from the beginning. So that's what I, I usually tell my residents, you end well when you start well. And I think also important is to have the family present and actively participating. And that's why your talk about communication is so important in time is because when the family is participating in every day and we don't have anything to hide from them, then it's much easier for them to pick up with you the time that we have not achieved the goal. And that time the family will understand that we all together as a team are going to decide about something else because this is not working. So open communication is a continuous communication. It's not just at the end of the day, you ask the social worker to set up a meeting and you go there and talk to the family. One more thing to add to Daniel's um, highlighting of the anterior section is uh, it has to do with timing as well. I have the genuine feeling that 10 years ago, we, we did not emphasize the importance to talk about uh, poor outcomes early in the beginnings. It's almost, we, we almost felt that, you know, let's wait it to happen. Uh, so we introduce end of life conversations. But as mechanical circulatory support is more prevalent and new technologies are being uh, implemented, especially for children, I think there is a genuine shift in the past, especially five years of emphasizing the importance of uh, communication even before going on mechanical circulatory support. And I think I feel that there is more work to be done but uh, we are seeing a change in early introduction of this conversation. And Katie can also talk about with her um, uh, early advanced care planning and a communication guideline for providers uh, dealing especially with children in mechanical circulatory support in ECMO. Thanks, Desi. Yeah, just a, a quick, like, I guess, reiteration of what um, both you and, and Daniel have mentioned um, and the importance of kind of early on um, delineating ECMO as a temporary support measure or a bridge to somewhere um, and aligning with families on that, on the with respect to the goals as to where we're going. And then, you know, if the direction ends up being 
in a, in a different path than what we'd all, all hoped for, then that's when this current paper that we're talking about kicks in. But certainly there are a lot of earlier communication steps, which as Desi mentioned, we've um, kind of given uh, or you know, proposed some potential uh, conversation frameworks around um, that start on day zero, so immediately following ECMO cannulation or ideally even beforehand if it's a more urgent cannulation process rather than emergent. Um, and I can, again, put the link in the chat to, to that communication guide um, that we, we wrote again as an interdisciplinary team about um, some communication um, around paediatric ECMO. Thank you so much for your input. Uh, I think I would highlight the importance of communication that you brought up uh, and again also highlight the need for planning and anticipation. I, th I think those are two factors uh, for this topic. Um, now, talking about specific lo logistics and uh, preparation, uh, it usually helps if there is any healthcare provider with whom the family has a developed special uh, trust uh, or uh, connection, it's always a good idea to invite them, of course, even if they are not um, uh, in service at the moment, but it may provide extra support and uh, trust and comfort for the family and the patient. Uh, we have a big team that can uh, support uh, the process. We should include them as well. Uh, and try to make it just like when we run a code, we have assignment of roles to make sure that the uh, event goes smoothly. Same thing, uh, I think we were discussing with Dr. Machado a couple of days ago, uh, how this should be actually approached as a procedure itself, right? We go with a checklist for intubation, we go with a checklist for the surgery. Uh, in the same case, we can do the same when we're going to approach our end of life discussions with the family. Uh, of course, we're going to, uh, we can't assume what is important for the patient and the family, right? We have to actually inquire and make sure we understand uh, what is important for them, and then uh, make sure that those needs uh, are met. Again, the second step has the checklist. I really invite you to uh, take a look at detail, look at it. I think it's quite helpful. Now that we have discussed family meetings, clinical aspects, uh, let's talk about the logistics or the practical uh, aspects. Location and mobilization. Uh, we, of course, make sure that the patient, the family have a, uh, an environment that is safe, that is private, that is uh, comfortable, uh, but that at the same time allows us to make sure that we achieve symptoms control. Now, does it have to happen in the ICU? Can it happen in any other setting in the hospital? Can it happen outdoors, for example? Uh, we must make sure we have good IV access you know, in, able to, uh, in order to be able to intervene if necessary. And uh, I just want to, <clears throat> may you think, uh, do you think an open chest, for example, is a limitation uh, for this type of approach? Are surgical dressings a limitation? We'll discuss a little bit that. I'll open up for discussion in a little bit about these topics. Uh, do we need alarms to be beeping? Do I need to know the heart rate went above 120? Uh, probably we don't. So we should actually silence the alarms because they cause distress for the families and patients. Uh, all the non-essential equipment, do, do I need to keep checking the central venous pressure? Even my arterial line, do I need to keep uh, it hooked up to, to the uh, monitor? Uh, every type of therapy or monitor device uh, that we can actually discontinue, we should in order to uh, make it easier for the family to have a physical connection with the patient, in order for the patient to feel more comfortable and even pain relief as well. We mentioned this before, depending on the type of cannulation that we have, let's anticipate, right? This is all about planning. This is all about standardizing care. This is all about anticipation. So let's anticipate the, pos the possible uh, symptoms that may develop and the decompensation as well. We, again, one more time, we should always make sure symptoms control is a priority. We have to make sure it's actually uh, what we're doing. This, this was quite interesting because uh, I, to be honest, I didn't think about it and I was happy when I read it. Uh, <laughs> devices for like an implantable cardioverter or the fibrillator, uh, they must be deactivated or otherwise it defeats the purpose, uh, don't they? Um, in case of emergency, and this is uh, interesting as well, uh, again, this is in case of emergency we, when we cannot really proceed, uh, proceed the regular way, a magnet placed uh, on the skin above the device 
may actually deactivate it, but just keep in mind, by removing the magnet, the device will be reactivated. Again, this is in case of emergency. And well, I just think- to add that shocks can be painful, right? And defeats the purpose of end of life, con symptom control. So that's another factor why devices should be deactivated is to prevent pain. Absolutely, thank you so much, Dr. Machado. Uh, I think this is actually for, for those of us that are uh, at the bedside, I think this was uh, quite useful. And I think it's one of my favorite uh, aspects of the article. Uh, we're talking about end of life and discontinuing ECMO. How exactly do we do that practically? So there's a couple of techniques that are described in the article. Uh, one of them is just uh, clamping the circuit. After clamping, we may or may not actually cut uh, the cameras themselves. And uh, some techniques that I think uh, uh, pictures speak for themselves uh, better than words. So you may see here how this is just simple clamping. If uh, that's all the intervention you're going to make, keep in mind uh, the ECMO machine itself will have to remain in the room. Uh, if you need some more space for comfort, uh, you may actually cut uh, and that way you can take the machine out of the room, making it more comfortable and less uh, crowded in the room if, if that's a need you have. Keep in mind, you may have a little bit of a blood spilling. Uh, so again, one more time, anticipation, let's, let's anticipate for that. Uh, a couple of techniques uh, following this, we may have the end to side uh, type of technique. Uh, we provide the picture with the tubing and how to connect uh, both cannulas. The beauty of it is we can actually, depending on the case, of course, and on the type of cannulation, but if we're able to do this, uh, we may even hide uh, behind a blanket like it's shown in, the, uh, in figure C. We may use the looping when you approximate both ends. And you may also uh, use the disconnection of the gas source, but one more time, anticipation, right? Uh, what symptoms uh, may the patient develop if this is the uh, technique that you're, you're going to use? Um, I'd like to open it a little bit. I won't put anybody on the spotlight, but I'd like to open uh, this discussion to the panelists. Uh, end of life preparation, when we are facing imminent death, there's so much to talk about, but if I could get the input from uh, some of the panelists, any comments that you want to share with you based on your experience would be highly appreciated. Uh, one comment about the logistics going a few steps, a uh, few slides um, uh, back is very common for especially cardiac patients and the infants is the parents have not held their child in weeks. Uh, if you think that the most natural process for a mother and a new father is to hold their newborn child. And we know that outcomes can be affected by uh, the longer you wait for surgery. So have that in mind that if parents have not held their child before the child is sick, once the child is really sick or pre-ECMO or after ECMO, there is also um, impediment factors that will have, will prevent the parents to hold their own child. And I think this is so important and we address that in the article and I haven't seen that written very often that uh, we don't believe that even the patient has open chest and uh, chest cannulation for the central VA ECMO, we don't see that as an impediment for holding. And I think that should be emphasized with a good multidisciplinary team is doable, is feasible. It's not always easy, but should not be a barrier for logistic and to allow proximity and contact of these parents with their sick child. Thank you, Dr. Machado. Can I comment on the role of, um, of Please, yeah. family visiting um, and that that's really important for, for families um, in this situation, but also that it be driven by the, by the child, if the child has had a voice, um, and the parents. 
and that it not be, you know, um, other family member saying, I need to come. It needs to be family driven um, and we need to allow for that space if there's time. Yeah, that means uh, also very important um, uh, siblings uh, and uh, close relatives. And uh, we tend to see this, um, especially now in, during COVID, as a secondary thing. But for the family unit, this is so important uh, to have uh, everybody that is significant to them. Uh, and we are visitors uh, now in this situation. They are the family. So uh, I think we have to be cognizant of the fact that even during COVID, we have to do this no matter what. And we have to advocate for the families and for the patients. And especially on ECMO, where many people have this preconceived ideas that this is horrible and families shouldn't see, other family members should not see, the siblings cannot see such, such a horrible thing, a patient being uh, on ECMO with blood coming out of the system but if you look at this picture you can protect very well and you can make it with the help of your uh, uh, child life if you have or your social workers and your uh, nurses to um, prepare the patient and then allow for family time this is uh, fundamental thank you daniel all righty, now but, that we- uh, If you can put back the last picture of the technical aspect, sorry, the one before. I, I would like to acknowledge the looping technique to Roxanne Kirsch from Toronto, that she uh, wrote a paper, I believe it's 2016, in neonates using the looping technique for end of life discontinu discontinuation on ECMO. Um, and we, we practice that the only um, caveat for adding and writing a paper with different techniques that we thought would be a practical aspect is when the patient has multi-site cannulation, like neck and groin, for example, that would make the looping technique very difficult. So having alternatives in technical possibilities uh, at ECMO discontinuation is one of the highlights of the paper. Uh, another factor of the looping technique is that if the patient has, is on, for example, VA ECMO and has, uh, for respiratory reasons, and has uh, a very uh, large cardiac output, uh, the patient makes, the, the moment that you loop uh, uh, arterial and venous cannula, can cause a significant shunt. So those are the factors that we need to weigh in when we choose a technical uh, aspect or a technical strategy of deciding how the uh, compassionate ACMO discontin discontinuation should proceed. Thank you, Dr. Machado. Uh, you made me remember one of our patients uh, that had a congenital heart disease and went to the OR right after delivery and uh, was in our unit for a couple of weeks uh, on ECMO. And around the end of life, we realized mother had never held the baby. So we're discussing end of life and uh, we didn't really, we did. But at some point we hadn't really stopped to think, has this mom ever held the baby? How is it going to be possible to have closure uh, without that? So it's, One it's of the really things Paula, that Katie wrote in her most recent article about good death that I thought was really, really important and beautiful in the same way is to try to appreciate the ordinary things in life, right? For a child is to go to school, socialize, uh, play games, play, uh, age appropriate uh, activities. And for newborns and neonates, infants is the ordinary things of life for families, like holding, changing, caring for their own child, like they were not sick. Makes sense. Thank you so much. Um, we have uh, discussed three of the four steps. Now we're going to talk about bereavement, um, bereaved families. We were mentioning before how we think, we uh, I refer to healthcare providers, uh, often we think about ECMO as a very high level of support, which it is, and we may think it's a traumatic experience. However, 
not all families perceive it that way. Some of them actually may see it as a gifted extra time that allows them to have interactions with the patient that otherwise they wouldn't have. Uh, the enhancement of, bereave of bereavement is important and we may actually be providing an opportunity for closure uh, that without ECMO again wouldn't be possible. Um, I just, we know, I know we have Tara uh, among us and uh, she's an expert in the area. And uh, I can't help myself by asking Tara, uh, what particularities of bereavement are specific for ECMO in your experience? I think the, uh, we have to be particular or, or consider the role of, um, of trauma for families. And, and, you know, Daniel spoke of how we need to also um, allow families to see these these patients and and to normalize the um, uh, you know the appearance of of children and to and to help have have our resources child life social work to help with those things, but I think we do have to remember that parents are often very um, the memories and the and the pictures that go through their minds are often very distressing for for parents whose children have been on ECMO. So that's always something to consider in terms of complicated grief and the need for possible, um, you know, additional resources for families. Absolutely. Thank you, Tara. Uh, I think one of the, of the concepts that is important as well, and we have touched about it not only now, but a couple of times throughout the presentation, uh, one way or another is compassion, right? Remember that the compassion comes from calm, shared passion, intense suffering. So when we are able to share the intense sufferings that these patients and these families go through, then we're being compassionate. That allows us to understand them better uh, and then provide support uh, for a healthy bereavement, like uh, you were saying. Um, we must uh, remember how the definition that we discussed before is not only about the patient, it's also about the family, but the definition also included healthcare providers, uh, everybody that has been around this topic or has been taking care of these patients, guys, this takes a toll on us, doesn't it? It, it can be really, really challenging, especially if these patients have been without, uh, with us in our unit for a while. Uh, we're humans, we connect, uh, we have emotions, and the moral distress and burnout is a real problem. We often have to face ethical dilemmas and I'm not only talking about the discontinuation of ECMO. Uh, sometimes we really have to ask ourselves what we're doing. Is it right? But not only discontinuation, but also continuation. Is it right to continue therapies and uh, life technological support in this patient? These ethical dilemmas are distressful and uh, cause moral distress on the staff. Uh, because of this, we really need to have awareness of the staff's emotional needs. And I, and I need to, to, you know, bring up our nurses uh, because they are at the bedside. Uh, most of the time, they really uh, get to know these patients pretty much, probably more than anybody else. And the toll they take is quite, quite remarkable. Uh, but this is not an individual type of phenomenon. This is not a one person problem. This is a collective experience. And because of this nature, it shouldn't be approached to resolve one individual experience. It should be actually approached from an institutional level, ideally. Uh, I just want to call in uh, Daniel Garros. Uh, Daniel, uh, when I read about the concept of moral distress and moral injury, I, I think this concept is so powerful from a psychological, from an ethical perspective. I really would appreciate if you gave us uh, your interpretation of a moral injury and moral distress. Uh, sure. Um, uh, this is um, one of my uh, uh, topics uh, uh, of um, research, uh, and uh, I think uh, it's a, it's a concept that one uh, intensivist once told me at the end of his uh, life as a physician, at the age of eighty-five. He told me that uh, now I have a word to express. I never knew how to say this. But now I have a word, a, a name for what I felt many times during my career. And what it is, is not to say that moral distress is bad, 
uh, moral distress is a normal reaction to a situation where we feel that perhaps the right thing to do uh, was uh, not possible to do, or the right thing to do in my perception I could not do, or the right thing to do in my perception I was witnessing that people um, have uh, not followed what I thought was correct. So that's why we go back to uh, important importance of communication and having the team on board. And uh, it's almost impossible to have a lot of people who uh, are involved with ECMO normally. You just not have one physician. You have a team of physicians. Uh, you have a team of nurses. You have a lot of other uh, healthcare professionals looking after the adult patient or the child. And then to have everybody to agree uh, when is the right time to stop, for example, on a COVID patient after being on the ventilator for three weeks, uh, it's a tough one. Many people say, let's give it another week, let's give it two weeks. Um, and uh, we don't know if this lung is, is really non-recoverable. Uh, I, don't, I don't wanna stop right now. Uh, and then the family is pushing to stop, for example. So those situations, if they are not uh, properly worked out, they can lead to significant moral distress. And, and uh, in, in my experience, uh, when I discuss this with different groups of physicians and nurses and all other healthcare professionals through the years, people remember a case of 30 years ago or 20 years ago that they can still not uh, sleep well about it and they have dreams about it and they have uh, physical feelings about it. Uh, so I think this is what moral distress is, uh, and, uh, and it's very important to realize that we don't want to abolish, we don't want to stop people from having moral distress, we want to have people that have compassion and, uh, and have their feelings and their opinions heard. And I think the simple fact that uh, you allow your team to tell you as a clinician, as a leader of the ECMO a team or a physician in charge or a nurse in charge, to allow the, the people express their ideas about uh, the conflict that they have either with the family or among themselves or with the team, just to express and to tell, I don't agree with this. I don't think we should do this or this or that. The simple fact that they are allowed to talk and express that, um, I think it's what leads to resolution. And that is always study in the literature that if I, if I don't agree with you, but I'm able to tell you that I don't agree with you, I, I will feel much better. And I can continue to do the best job as, uh, uh, as I can. And I think this is the importance of uh, dealing with the moral distress in these situations. And moral injury is when moral distress goes beyond uh, this um, aspect and uh, things are not discussed, things are um, not taken into consideration and conflict persists. And then uh, it, it creates a situation of moral injury. And that means that uh, you lose your integrity as a person and uh, you ended up uh, uh, thinking that you didn't do the right thing. And now you are not a, as good a physician, as a good nurse as you should be. And then you, you have this feeling that perhaps I should quit. I should change professions. I should do something else. And that is a problem. So I think we have to uh, resolve this before we reach to that point. To the Ed's perspective is, uh, I would like to emphasize that sometimes moral distress is present on uh, layers of the team that we don't suspect initially. And I would like to include the ECMO specialist in that part because they, they are at the bedside every day. They are seeing the phases of care of the, the, the patient is receiving, although their ultimate purpose is to care of the machine and the patient combination, they do suffer of moral distress as well and should be integrated to all discussions as well. Um, uh, on top of that, uh, as we practice and we learn primary palliative care, 
naming the emotion or identifying the emotion is vital so you can address that emotion. So coining the terms moral distress, moral injury is so important for you. Once you identify the problem, you can address the problem. You never can address a problem you don't identify. Thank you, Dr. Machado. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, I think these are very powerful concepts. And I think when we discuss about the uniqueness and uh, the need for individualizing uh, approaches, it's not only about the patient, right? It's about the healthcare providers that we have in our team. We may have different concepts and different perspectives uh, that we actually, again, having open communication should actually be able to discuss about. All righty, so we are getting close to uh, an ending, sadly. Uh, we have discussed the four steps uh, that were proposed by the authors. I just want to touch base on a couple of things. I personally think uh, one of the biggest benefits uh, of this article uh, is uh, an attempt for a standardization of care while embracing the uniqueness of each patient. And uh, we tend to think that it's not possible to have something systematic and standardized and value the uniqueness and uh, individual values but this is the perfect example that we can. And the way I like to call this is uh, compassion with structure. Uh, when I was applying for my palliative care uh, fellowship, they asked me, okay, why do you want to do a fellowship in palliative care? And my answer was, or tend to be something like, we, we cannot really rely on our empathy, our communication skills, our personality when we're dealing with patients that are, are, are actually dying and these families will never forget that day, we must become professionally compassionate. And one more time, this guideline, this checklist, this structured approach to end of life on ECMO is a great example of what I think uh, is compassion with the structure. Uh, and of course, uh, this approach allows us to have different values different preference, different practices. But again, as a team with open communication, we can approach keeping in mind the common goal that is providing a good death for our patient, families, and healthcare providers. Uh, barriers, of course, uh, further research uh, is needed for feasibility, utility, and maybe some practical barriers, especially in the logistic uh, aspect in, in step three of the, of the process. Uh, and I think this, this is difficult, but I think family perceptions of death experience is an area of research that is quite valuable and it will allow us actually to identify markers uh, for the impact that this approach uh, will generate. If we were to have some conclusions, it would be ECMO is a complex therapy with high mortality and a structural approach for compassionate end of life is recommended. The proposed framework and checklist may serve as a guide for healthcare providers. Uh, I just want to thank everybody for your attention and for the authors of the article, for your contribution to the palliative care and the critical care world. As a clinician myself, uh, I really appreciate uh, this structured compassion approach that you guys offered. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paulo, for the presentation of the paper. Uh, it's a really, really good paper, and this topic is uh, so important for the families, for the patients, and for the healthcare providers. We were talking about uh, including the ECMO specialists in this preparation and this talks. I remember one case that we have back home that we even include the cleaning lady because it was a VV ECMO patient, nine weeks there. Every day she would go to the room and the kid was awake and talk to the kid. So when the decision was made for ECMO discontinuation, we prepared the entire team and we tried to include the, the, the echo technician, the x-ray technician. So everybody that for that nine weeks were going to that room, seeing that kid that was a nine-year-old uh, uh, talking and, and interacting that we decided to discontinuate. So it's, it's a preparation that we have to do with the entire team. And uh, it's also so good uh, to, to listen to all the experience, all, all of you. And uh, I think this, this panel is perfect. I'm very happy to, to have all of you. I think Tara has some uh, more uh, considerations to, to uh, share with us, with her experience in, in a very uh, different way as us, as uh, most of us are uh, um, as uh, uh, ICU physicians, she has a, a special role on, on all of these. I would love to, to listen more to her uh, uh, inputs. Yeah, I think many of the points have certainly been highlighted and um, 
I, I just want to um, reinforce the the role of you know caring for families. Their their bereavement is impacted from the beginning of their of their journey, and Daniel touched on that. I think that that's a really important point, um, and also that you know involving involving the staff is very important um, in terms of. Um, you know, their support and their emotional debriefing and their and their um, their their moral distress uh, care for sure. Um, a couple of things that that haven't been mentioned, I did put in the chat. Uh, one was in regards to caring for families upon the potential return to the site. Um, I have had a couple of families that that were really felt they would ever be unable to return to the hospital. Um, and acknowledge that they have other children and they may end up there um, in an urgent scenario and, and be very distressed by the return to that site. Um, so that's something that I, I try to talk with families about now as well. Um, those are a couple of things, couple of things to highlight. Thank you. Yeah, the return to the site is a good one, uh, Tara, because uh, think about this. Uh, this families have become part of our day-to-day -day, uh, uh, ICU family. We see them, especially the prolonged ECMO runs. Uh, they are there every day, and we go there and do rounds every day. We laugh together. We cry together. And out of a sudden, one moment, this is cut. Everything finished. We had a couple of experience. One time, one family just walked into the ICU the next day, just walk in uh everybody knew them they did not need to buzz so they just walk in but their child was not there so everybody look at them and, and say so kind of what do you want uh, did you forget anything here and they said no we just want to come and see you guys and say hello and uh and and then next day three days later they came back and they say now uh, we want to say our thank you and we want to say goodbye. And then we uh, also allow uh, the families, if they want, we allow them to come back uh, three months, uh, four months later. We schedule a meeting. We usually give uh, um, uh, our card to the family with our phone numbers and our contacts. And they are allowed to uh, contact us uh, three, four months after everything settles down to have a meeting about uh, things. And we offer the opportunity to be there in the hospital, like Tara said, or sometimes in the co coffee uh, place in front of the hospital if they don't feel comfortable. And we just go there to talk. And we offer them, if we have autopsy, we offer them the results of the autopsy. We ask them who are the favorite people that they want there. So who are the nurse, who are the favorite doc, who are the people that they really want that uh, to be there. And, and we do those meetings. And this is such an incredible experience for them of closure, but for us as well as closure. And this is something that we should do more. Uh, and I think it's a good uh, way to, uh, to finish off. Thank you, Daniel. That was another very important point that I wanted to raise as well. That's a, a very important part for our care. Daniel and, and Tara, once I realized that some parents, they not only grieve the loss of the child, but they grieve the loss of relationships. So a follow up, uh, I believe should ha start having some structure, uh, if not existing in the hospital facility, I think that's another point of future directions is how do you approach that, the follow-up to bereaved parents and, and, uh, and what support uh, resources are available for these families. Uh, and I think it can be structured, it can be um, implemented and only generates quality of, um, of care and prevention of complicated grief. Yeah, it would follow. be interesting we, work in future to see what what families find most useful in that regard, for sure. Yeah, we, fo we follow the families. Tara's group follows the families for one year after every death in the ICU. And uh, in, if, if the families want to continue, they continue following them. And we do a memorial service once a year in the hospital for all the families who have lost their children. And they come in and they celebrate and they bring their pictures and they and they they talk to each other 
and uh, we have uh, some of us go there and uh, it's an important thing for uh, closure as well for them. And uh, there are a lot of questions there, Grace. I don't know if you want to address those. Yeah, uh, I think we have some time for questions. We have a, a few more panelists that didn't have a chance to, to get their, their inputs on that. If uh, I think Julie uh, just left, but I think Santiago is and Charmil, they are both around. If you want to comment any specific topic about this presentation, uh, uh, would be very nice. I think they are there. Okay, so we have several questions. I'm not sure you're going to be able to address all of them, but I'll try my best uh, uh, to summarize. And there's some on the chat uh, box, they're not on q and I'll try to find them. Uh, uh, anyway, there's a, a few questions um, uh, 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 from Miguel. Uh, he's asking how we should uh, uh, follow up with the family during the, their stay in the intensive care. And he's uh, asking us to um, talk a little bit to each kind of patients we should uh, call the palliative care in the ICU. Once you answer that. Uh, uh, so the palliative care, I think uh, Katie may maybe uh, be able to tell her, her opinion, but in my opinion, and is becoming more and more common in the literature, as all these patients on ECMO should have a palliative care consultation. Not because palliative care is for a good uh, uh, end of life. Palliative care is for good life, is for good living, while you are still uh, receiving aggressive treatment. Why is that? It's because palliative care is not just to improve the end of life care, it's actually to make their kids' life during the stay on ECMO uh, more palatable to them and to the families and to the staff. For example, with principles of palliative care, they are so important, uh, universal. For example, bringing the pet into the ICU, the family's pet, uh, we do that here, uh, and, uh, or, the, or the hospital pet. Uh, so uh, it's open uh, as long as the patient doesn't have an open chest. We let the the, the dog to come into the bed with the family, uh, with the with the child. And uh, principles of palliative care are like that. So that's why it's important because we are so busy as intensivists and we don't remember such things. And palliative care teams remember, and they know also to facilitate dialogue and decrease conflict. Right, Katie? Yeah, I mean I completely agree that concurrent care is recommended in terms of um, both pursuing curative therapies and simultaneously uh, prioritizing trying to make you know every day as good as it can be for a child and I think that's a very worthwhile and valuable endeavor to achieve and how to integrate um, these palliative care principles into the lives of um, our patients there's lots of different models to consider um, Daniel's advocating there for a subspecialty palliative care consultation um, obviously this is not a feasible option everywhere globally um, and so I also have a, a am passionate about both primary um, palliative care so you know um, training for and you know understanding by intensivists or you know uh, other subspecialty pediatric groups in terms of um, uh, uh, their you know training and having good communication skills etc um, there's a few other models um, we wrote a paper on um, integration using champions so palliative uh, care specific training for, for example, in um, members of the um, interdisciplinary ICU care team. Uh, there's embedded models which have been described in oncology where, for example, you actually have a, a palliative care team member embedded into the oncology team so that they round um, with, with the oncology teams. So there's lots of different models and, and ways and methods to integrate palliative care principles into the lives of um, uh, our children and their families or you know, any, any really patients um, who are critically or seriously unwell. Um, and the values are, the benefits are, you know, kind of undeniable. One of the things that I think is also important to address, and I think there was some of the comments or questions somewhere in the chat, is the timing, right? Like when is the proper timing? And sometimes there is no proper timing or there is no available resources. So uh, learning primary palliative care models is very helpful in that sense. And sometimes you, you may not need a primary uh, a palliative care specialist but I also emphasize that it's important to add early on the, the palliative care specialist 
not only for the difficult conversation part, but for symptom control, for uh, difficult symptom control. If you are facing that point, the worst thing that I think the palliative care colleagues want from us is to be called for eight hours before death. Right? So early, the best, uh, not too late, of course, but use the palliative care specialty in their myriad of benefits that they can provide. And there's one question specifically about that. And uh, I, I, so I'm curious to know what your program deal with that. Uh, Donna Taylor is asking if we have an automatic palliative, palliative care consultation at when every patient starts on ECMO. So how does it work on your programs? My previous program, we were able to integrate that, but we had the availability of the palliative care team. Uh, here in my uh, current hospital, we, we don't do this as an obligation or automatically when the patient is starts ECMO. How does it work on your programs, guys? In my former program, uh, we discussed about putting on the order set. So it becomes automatic, but like resources are not always available. And sometimes it's just not the right timing, right? You just put someone on ECMO and then 24 hours later, you know, so family that may not want to hear or talk about it, they still might be in shock. So initially, I think my opinion changed over time should we put an order set or not? Uh, right now, I feel that most important is to see how the family is open to it and then you trigger. Okay. But have a screen, have a method, a process where you can identify early on uh, how, how early can you call in. I agree with you, Desiree. I think the relationship with palliative care is more authentic when there's when there's a a role or, or a meaning behind that at the time of consult. And we have to be careful. I always say this and people get upset with me sometimes when I say that uh, uh, the, word, the name palliative care, if you use that name, uh, brings uh, bad feelings for some healthcare professionals around you. Are you giving up on this patient? What are you talking about? We're still in the you know, pushing, maybe you're going to have a lung transplant after this COVID. What are you talking about palliative care? It's because people don't understand the concept of palliative care, the modern concept of palliative care. So uh, again, uh, I would say it's important that uh, we inform the family that we're going to bring a team of specialists in uh, assisting uh, uh, patients with conditions like this. There is a team that can bring expertise in areas uh, that we as intensivists or ECMO specialists uh, are uh, not uh, uh, so familiar with, which is like significant uh, alternatives for symptom control, uh, enhancing living with this uh, condition like we are now and uh, an ECMO sitting in the ICU with the Avalon cannula, this big sitting in your neck and, uh, and making uh, your life better. And this family is also, this uh, specialists are very good in, uh, in allowing families to have, and they have all the time in the world that we don't have to sit down with you and, and also listen to you and being able to uh, convey your concerns and address them back to our team. So it's a great group of support specialists that we have and happen that they are called palliative care. So in fact, in our hospital, palliative care is a different name. Uh, it's called assist team. But uh, this is an important concept. I don't think it should be obligatory, but should be a big thing in every ECMO patient that uh, stays for a few more than just three days on ECMO post uh, heart surgery. One of the comments was also about family involvement, right? Uh, I would like to acknowledge the third author of the paper is the, is, her name is Laurie Deo Montuno and she's the mother of Myla Montuno. Uh, Laurie Deo, she goes by Ari and Mike Montuno, or, uh, I think it was, it's important to account the parents early on in the care of their child, not only in end of life. And, um, Ari became a bereavement coordinator after the death of her child. So I, 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 when I wrote the paper, I could not not have Lori 
uh, Ari in um, in the paper, and and I think that speaks to the fact like how much should we involve the parents? I, I would say if they're willing to a lot. Uh, Grace, there was a question about uh, eCPR, uh, and I think this is very complicated um, because uh, eCPR is that ECMO that happens like this in the middle of a cardiac arrest, uh, and we are providing this as a rescue uh, for life saving. Um, and then, how do you deal with that as opposed to a plan uh, ECMO for a patient that is uh, starting to go into stages of uh, heart failure, for example, or a respiratory distress that is now starting to get uh, worse and we need to put an ECMO. ECPR brings, like Tara said, much more trauma to the situation and, and needs a lot of more debriefing with that family to go through the process. And also the results are not as good um, as, as other ECMOs, for example, for neonatal respiratory, for example. So uh, there's a lot of... Uh, more ECPR nowadays in our ICUs, uh, ECMO as a resuscitation, uh, part of the resuscitation uh, technique. And I think those families, sometimes the patients would die even with ECMO within hours. So how do you do that in terms of supporting families and, and doing a compassion discontinuation? And I think even though it's a very difficult process and very traumatic process, I think one of the things that uh, we have to think about is to offer the family time with their child. Even if the child is already partially dead or so, so to speak, uh, still connected to the machine, I think it's important that we are not in a hurry. We don't need to disconnect right now, even if the organs are not functioning and, and, and the heart has a heart rate of 40, uh, to let them stay with their child, uh, give them time. Uh, if they want uh, pictures that they never had the opportunity in a newborn to have with their child, let's get the photographer, let's get the, the child dressed nicely and allow the last hours to be meaningful to them. So I think it's important that even though eCPR is difficult and more traumatic, it still allows for many of the things that we were talking about here. Does any one of you uh, suffer any administrative pressure to stop it? Uh, for example, you said we are not in a hurry. As healthcare providers, we are not in a hurry, but what about in the administrative way? We need the bed, that bed, that bed uh, with the ECMO running costs money. Does anyone have ever faced some pressure? Okay, you decided that it's time to stop, stop it uh, uh, as soon as possible. Don't, uh, don't give that time to the family. I, we never experienced that. Right. Yeah, I can personally, I've never, I've never experienced anything like that. And I, I think while ECMO is a profoundly resource intensive um, uh, therapy, both from a human level, as well as physical tangibles and our cognitive load, I think the resource piece really should be separated from the clinician at the bedside and, and kind of thought about at a higher level that's, a, that's mm -hmm. away from the clinician at the bedside or as a fiduciary responsibility to the patient and the family. Perfect. I have had an experience where there was that did occur, um, but it was in the postmortem aspect of, of care. And I, I now talk with nurses about um, advocating for that time and space for families and, and really holding that for them. Um, it's a very important time for families and we're, we're protecting their, uh, their coping down the road by holding that space for them. I don't see any other questions on the chat box. They, they got a little bit mixed with the, a lot of comments. Something that I would uh, advise all of you guys is to click on the links of the papers that was uh, placed on the chat box because when we finish, we close uh, the meeting, we are not going to be able to get these papers. So if you just click, they're going to open on another uh, uh, tab on your browser and you can uh, check these papers uh, afterwards. So I, I cannot see any other uh, question. Do you see guys, do you have any other comments? There's, there's one comment and one question about uh, what to do with the team uh, in terms of debriefing and, and uh, things like that after a traumatic uh, 
uh, ECMO ending, or, it, or even every time you stop ECMO, uh, what do you do with the team? So I think, uh, and the person suggested that they do debriefings. And I think this is very important, is one of the ways to help the team to cope with this uh, very difficult situations is to allow time for them to talk about it. And uh, we have two techniques. One is uh, a preemptive technique. So is the town hall situations where is there a complicated case in the ICU, for example, uh, a patient on COVID, adult, uh, young adult, 38 years old, uh, on ECMO for now four weeks and the lung is not getting better uh, and the patient is going through multi-organ dysfunction. And there's a, a lot of discussion in the ICU. Should we, should we continue, should we not? And at the end of the day, you stop. This is very traumatic. So what you do, you allow a brief time of like uh, 45 minutes or so for the team that was involved that day when that happened uh, to actually discuss, not to re relive the experience. You don't do that on the, diff on the first aid diffusion uh, moment. You just let people to say, what uh, is everybody feeling about this? And what are the natural things that will happen on the next two weeks for you as you think about these things? So this is kind of a preemptive meeting. That's, called, that's, that's what is called diffusing or first aid technique. And then you have a formal debriefing that you can do within a week or so. Don't let it go more than a week, but allow time for people that are not on call to come in and, and then have an open discussion about that case. Again, ideally with uh, somebody with some, some preparation in terms of crisis management, uh, it's important. And that is called the debriefing technique. But the town hall, what I mentioned before, is while you're still dealing with the problem, let's do an information session about what's going on. So everybody is on the same page. Everybody understands the rationale, why we're going for another week, why we're stopping now, why we're thinking this way. So the, the communication, as Paulo uh, alluded to in the beginning of his, uh, his comments on this uh, seminar, that we can disseminate and people understand where we are at at that moment. That's called a town hall or an information session. Not too many speakers, that confuses the picture, but a good moment where the leadership of the ECMO team and then open for everybody to ask questions is so important because that prevents moral distress. It has been shown that prevents moral distress. So these three, three types of meeting are very important to uh, deal with uh, better with this uh, very, very uh, complicated situation that we are now living uh, every day. I would add to Daniel that uh, on, well, in other institutions I practice is debriefing immediately after the death with the team within the same shift, if possible, uh, the follow up. And uh, one time I can think of that was something unusual for us, but it was not specific about one patient, but we had like two months of several deaths. And that took um, a turn in many of us intensivists and nurses. So we had a specific meeting, not to talk about one specific case, but hey, let's, let's meet as a group and just acknowledge that there were rough two months and we have several deaths and what are the resources we can have for us physicians, for nurses um, at hand. And that meeting was coordinated with um, the hospital support and the palliative care team. And it was very well received. I think after the meeting, uh, the word kind of spread out and a lot of people like, why we're not invited to the meeting, including the surgeons? <laughs> I think uh, we just have, Daniel, you're muted. You want to say something? No, I think uh, we are already uh, um, uh, passing yeah. the time, but I just want to uh, um, say that somebody put, uh, uh, Donna put a comment about, uh, uh, about conflict with family that refuse to stop. And that is one of the most difficult things that uh, you can face. We could spend another hour talking about mm -hmm. 
but I think uh, I think this is this is very 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 important and happens. Uh, not everything is is uh, rosy and and uh, beautiful on mm -hmm. on this compassion end of life on ECMO. We have situation we have come across every one of us situations where the family simply don't want to stop, and how you how you deal with that. And I think uh, this is uh, something that requ requires a lot of uh, good communication. Uh, listening, good conversations, empathy, time, and a lot of understanding what's behind. Many times the families have something behind they are not expressing to you. And palliative care is very good at bringing those things up. Calling the ethics uh, team, uh, ethics committee is very important as well. We all know what the right thing to do is, but sometimes hearing from the outside and the family also having the opportunity to tell other people is so important so i don't know I, we if katie or anybody wants to uh, just have a one sentence about this yeah just a, like a very quick comment I mean, uh, conflict is extraordinarily challenging i think the communication guide that we uh kind of proposed aims to try and avoid this by aligning from a very early um time point towards kind of a goal-directed therapy and defining ecmo from the outset as a bridge so a temporary support structure that is not a cure as, as daniel alluded to um i think yes uh you know like uh conscientious objection to discontinuation of ECMO as you know currently exists for brain death is something that is is, is very terrifying for intensivists and um, I think it's something that we as a profession need to kind of join together to kind of strategize how to how to deal with I think it's one of the biggest challenges that we're we're facing great unfortunately I think you have to stop guys been one hour and a half already it was amazing I want to thank everybody uh, the chat was very active Adrian and and a, a lot of people giving a lot of input not only questions but sharing experience and knowledge on the chat as well thank you very much uh, for that this uh, panel is really great so i'm very happy to have all of you for sure we are going to have more opportunities to join and and uh, another uh, uh, meetings i would really like to have all of you with us again i just want to ask if Sharmil has something uh, to say he is the the co-chair of this uh, uh uh journal club he's from the chip network so it's this is a joint uh a journal club from congenital heart academy and uh chip net network so i just like to say if he has something to say uh Herman? nothing much grace uh i learned a few things today uh uh especially uh regarding the palliative care uh i'm, I'm really sorry i joined late uh, but yes, I mean, I learned a lot and this is a great discussion and, and the great panelists here. Uh, and I look forward to have them again. Perfect. I would suggest to all of you guys, uh, if you have the opportunity, talk to your leadership and uh, use this webinar that's going to be on YouTube as a start conversation to talk about moral distress with your teams. You're going to do, we are planning to do this here in my program. And uh, I think it's a very good idea. It was really reach of information and experience from people who really knows what they are doing. So I think this is going to be a good starting point uh, for all the programs to have more debate about this. Uh, I'm sure everybody can benefit for some of the uh, knowledge and experience that we got uh, uh, from today's session. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Hope to see you for the fetal cardiology. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.